In today's video lecture, we are going to finish the packet of notes dealing with capacitors and inductors. If you recall, in the previous two lectures, we introduced two new electronic devices, the capacitor and the inductor. Very, very similar, but also very different devices from one another. Anyway, we're going to continue on with the lecture now and look at other properties of capacitors and inductors and do some more problems. So in section 6.3 of the book, we're going to look at capacitors and inductors connected in series and parallel. So let's start with capacitors connected in parallel. Suppose you have n capacitors connected in parallel. They all have the same voltage. We'll call it V because they're connected in parallel. They all share the same top node. They all share the same bottom node. The current through the first capacitor, let's call I1. Let's call the current through the second capacitor I2. All the way up to the last capacitor, its current is I sub n. The total current going into those parallel combinations, I, is then equal to I1 plus I2 plus I sub n. But what is I sub 1? The current through any capacitor is its capacitor value times the derivative of its voltage. So I1 is C1 times dV dt. I2 is C2 times dV dt. All the way up to In is equal to Cn times dV dt. Which means the total current I can be written as C1 plus C2 plus 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 all the way up to Cn times dV dt. Now let's look at an equivalent situation on the right. If we wanted to replace those n parallel capacitors by one equivalent capacitor, it's going to have a current I and it's going to have a voltage V. I and V are related by this expression here. For these to be the same, what we see then is that C equivalent has to just be the same as the sum of the individual capacitor values. So we end up with a very simple equation. The equivalent capacitance of parallel connected capacitors is just the sum of the individual capacitor values, which is the same form as for series connected resistors. So a similar equation, but remember, resistors in series add, capacitors in parallel add. Let's look at capacitors in series now. Suppose you have these n capacitors connected in series, and you have a current flowing into the first capacitor. That current, of course, is going to cause positive charges to accumulate on one plate of the capacitor. That is going to cause the same number of negative charges to accumulate on the other plate of that capacitor. Those protons that are going to be leaving that negative plate have to go somewhere. They're going to deposit on that positive plate, which in turn would cause the same number of negative charges on that plate all the way down to the end. In other words, all of these capacitors are going to have the same charge. Capacitors in series have to have the same charge. Now let's look at the voltage drop across each capacitor. Let's call them V1, V2, all the way up to Vn. The total voltage drop across all the capacitors is going to be V1 plus V2 plus 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 Vn. It's going to be V1 plus V2 plus plus Vn. But what is the voltage across an individual capacitor? The voltage across a capacitor is 1 over its capacitance times the integral of its current. So V1 is given by that, V2 is given by that, all the way up to here with Vn. Notice, because the capacitors are in series, they all have the same current, just call it I of t. We can then factor out things that are the same for all, this integral here, and we see that the total voltage is 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 dot 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 plus 1 over Cn, all of that times the integral of I dt. Now if we look on the right, 
This equivalent situation, if we wanted to replace those n series capacitors by a single capacitor, its voltage current relationship is given by this expression here. For this to be equivalent, though, that would mean that these two expressions would have to be equal to each other, which means that 1 over C equivalent is equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 dot 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 plus 1 over Cn. Inverting both sides, we get the final equation for capacitors connected in series. The equivalent capacitance is the reciprocal of the sum of the reciprocals of the individual capacitors. You'll probably recognize this equation as being the same form as for parallel connected resistors. So capacitors in series combine like resistors in parallel. Likewise, capacitors in parallel, the previous page, combine like resistors in series. Now let's look at the voltage division for series connected capacitors. And you can probably guess it's going to be different than it was for resistors. Sure enough, we know from the previous page that that current is going to deposit positive charges there and the same number of negative charges here and it will propagate along the line of capacitors. Once again, we know that each capacitor in series has the same accumulated charge. Since capacitance is charge per unit volt, we know that the voltage across the capacitor is the charge over the capacitance. What this means is that the larger capacitors will have smaller voltage drops when connected in series. We can look at that more mathematically with these equations on the left here. The voltage drop across the X capacitor is 1 over C sub X times the integral of the current. We saw that the total voltage drop V was equal to V1 plus V2 plus 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 Vn, which means it was 1 over C1 times the integral of the current plus 1 over C2 times the integral of the current, etc. So we see that the ratio of the voltage drop across the xth capacitor versus the total voltage is equal to this expression divided by this expression. So we end up with this expression here. You can cancel these currents and you end up with this expression here for voltage division. The voltage drop across the x capacitor is the total voltage times 1 over that capacitor value divided by 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 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 1 over Cn. Once again, we see what we saw up above here. The larger the individual capacitor, the smaller its corresponding voltage is. A good analogy would be with water balloons. Imagine you have water balloons of different sizes. Larger water balloon would correspond to a larger capacitance. Smaller water balloon would correspond to a smaller capacitance. Now suppose they all have the same amount of water. Amount of water would be equivalent to charge. Capacitors in series have the same charge. So let's assume we have water balloons of different sizes with the same amount of water in each one, the same volume of water. Which water balloon is going to have the most water pressure? It's actually going to be the smallest water balloon. The smaller the water balloon, the more water pressure, assuming they all have the same volume of water. Likewise, capacitors, if they all have the same charge, the smallest capacitor is going to have the largest voltage. Let's look at inductors now. Let's start with inductors in series. Inductors in series, of course, all have the same current I, and let's call their voltages V1, V2, all the way up to V sub n. The total voltage V is then equal to V1 plus V2 plus V sub n. The voltage across any inductor is its inductor value times the derivative of its current. So V1 is that, 
v2 is that, vn is that. We can then factor out the di dt, and we get the total voltage is the sum of the individual inductor values times the derivative of the common current. Now let's look at replacing that series connection of inductors with a single equivalent inductor. That equivalent inductor is going to have a voltage drop V equal to L equivalent times di dt. And of course, if that has to be equal to this expression, we need L equivalent to equal to L1 plus L2 plus plus L sub n. So for inductors in series, the equivalent inductor value is just the sum of the individual inductances, which is the same equation as for series connected resistors. So inductors and resistors have similar combination equations. Capacitor is the oddball out. Now let's look at inductors in parallel. In parallel, these inductors all share the same voltage, V. Why? Because they have the same two nodes that they're connected to the yellow node on top, and the pink node on the bottom. And they have their individual currents, call them I1, I2, all the way up to I sub n. The total current I into this parallel combination of inductors then can be broken down into I is equal to I1 plus I2, all the way up to I sub n. But once again, using the IV characteristics for an inductor, the current through an individual inductor is 1 over its inductor value times the integral of its voltage. So I1 is given by that, I2 is given by that, all the way up to there. We can factor out the integral of V dt, and we get this expression down here. If we wanted to replace this parallel combination of inductors by a single equivalent inductor, its current I is going to be 1 over L equivalent times the integral of V dt. As before, if we want to set these equal to each other, we see that 1 over L equivalent has to equal 1 over L1 plus 1 over L2, etc. If you take the inverse of both sides, we get our final equation here. L equivalent is the reciprocal of the sum of the reciprocal of individual inductance values. Once again, inductors in parallel have an equation very similar to resistors in parallel. So we see that whether they're connected in series or in parallel, the inductor equations are like the resistor equations, the capacitor equations are the ones that are opposite. Final thing we'll look at right here now is what happens to current division if you have a whole bunch of inductors connected in parallel? As we saw on the previous page, this total current I gets broken down into I1, I2, all the way down to I sub n. We see that the current through a specific inductor, I sub x, is 1 over L sub x times the integral of V dt. We also see that the total current is I1 plus I2 plus all the way up to I sub n. So the ratio of Ix to I is equal to this over that. The integrals cancel out, and then we can solve for Ix. The current through the xth inductor is the total current times 1 over its inductor value over 1 over L1 plus 1 over L2, etc. Once again, we see that the inductor current division equation is equivalent to the resistor current division equation. So here we have two capacitors connected in series to a 12 volt source. We have a 0.3 microfarad capacitor and a 0.6 microfarad capacitor. We're first asked to find the corresponding voltages using voltage division, and then find the corresponding energy stored in each capacitor. And then we want to see what an equivalent capacitor value would be and verify that the energy that would be stored in the equivalent capacitor equals the energy that is stored in the two individual capacitors. To solve this problem, we'll start by using the 
voltage division equation for capacitors. The voltage across the first capacitor is the total voltage times the reciprocal of its capacitance over the sum of the reciprocals of all the capacitors, and there are only two of them here. If you work out this math, you get 12 times 2 thirds or 8 volts. Likewise, if you solved for VC2, you would see that VC2 is 4 volts. So the first thing we see is that the smaller capacitor has the larger voltage. Next thing to point out, even though the problem did not ask for this, is let's look at the charges stored on the individual capacitors. Remember, because they are in series, whatever charge is on this plate, you're going to have the same negative charge on that plate, which in turn would cause the same positive charge on this plate and the same negative charge on that plate. We know the charge in a capacitor is the capacitance times the voltage. So Q1, the charge stored on the first capacitor, is going to be its capacitance, 0.3 microfarad, times its voltage, which is going to be 2.4 microcoulombs of charge. Likewise, the charge on the second capacitor is twice as big, but has half the voltage drop and the same charge. Once again, this is expected because capacitors in series have to have the same charge. So far, everything makes somewhat sense. But the real odd thing is if we look at the energy. If you look at the energy stored in each capacitor, this is where we get the surprising result. The energy stored in the first capacitor is 1 half times its capacitance times the voltage across that capacitor squared. You get 9.6 microjoules of energy. The energy stored in the second capacitor is 1 half times 0.6 times 10 to the minus 6 farads times 4 volts squared, you get 4.8 microjoules. And the total energy then is just the sum of the two, 9.6 plus 4.8, or 14.4 microjoules. But what we see, little anti-intuitive, is the smaller capacitor has the larger energy storage. And this is very anti-intuitive at first. If you think about it, however, suppose you had two water balloons of different sizes, smaller and larger. You have the same volume of water in each, which is what we have here with these capacitors. They're in series, they have the same charge. So imagine two water balloons of different sizes but with the same amount of water in. Which water balloon has more energy stored? It's actually the smaller water balloon. The smaller water balloon is going to be the one that's going to have the tighter feel. It's the one that's going to explode more when you throw it at someone. So once again, capacitors in series, it is actually the smaller capacitor that stores more energy. Now, if you had capacitors in parallel, then you get the situation that you would intuitively expect. With capacitors in parallel, the larger capacitor will have more stored energy because capacitors in parallel have the same voltage. So an energy of 1 half times C V squared, since V is going to be the same, the larger capacitor will have more energy. But if they're in series, it is actually the smaller capacitor that has more energy.
In the final part of this question, we want to now verify that the total energy stored, 14.4 microjoules, is equivalent to the energy that would be stored in an equivalent capacitor. So see equivalent. Remember capacitors in series have an equivalent capacitance that follows an equation similar to resistors in parallel. So it is a reciprocal of the sum of the reciprocals. So C equivalent is 1 over 1 over 0.3 microfarad plus 1 over 0.6 microfarad. It's 0.2 microfarad. By the way, if you think about the shortcut equations we had for resistors, we can apply the same shortcut equations for capacitors. Remember two resistors in parallel. R in parallel with R over 2 is equal to R over 3. Here, C in series with C over 2 is equal to C over 3. So you can use the same shortcut equations, but it's just going to be opposite. Parallel versus series, series versus parallel. What's the energy stored in this equivalent capacitor? It's going to be one half times the capacitor value times the voltage, quantity squared, 14.4 microjoules, the same as the sum of the two operating independently. Next, we're going to look to see how placing a capacitor in an op-amp circuit gives us even more functionality with an op-amp. We're going to look at specifically differentiator circuits and integrator circuits, and they are covered very briefly in section 7.7. Imagine what looks like an inverting amplifier circuit, but instead of putting two resistors, R2 and R1, we have one resistor in the feedback path and then a capacitor in the forward path. And let's assume we connect that up to an input signal, Vn of t. Let's analyze this circuit. First thing we want to do is let's assign the variable V sub c as the voltage across the capacitor. We then know that the current through the capacitor, I sub c, is equal to c times dvc dt. Notice, by the way, the orientation, if we define VC with the plus here and the minus here, the current IC is defined as a current going from the plus to the minus. It is the same passive sign convention used with resistors. We know that the non-inverting input of the amplifier, the op amp, is set to ground. So V plus is equal to zero volts. By virtue of the Virtual short circuit approximation, you know that V minus is also equal to zero volts. Let's now try to do a KCL equation at this inverting input. So KCL at the V minus node, current going to the left is negative IC. Current going to the right is zero. Current going through this resistor R is zero minus V out over R. Solving for V out, we get V out is equal to minus R times IC, but IC is C dV C D T. Finally, we see that Vc, the voltage across the capacitor, is the same as Vn. If you think about doing a KVL here, we get minus Vn plus Vc is equal to zero. We get our final answer then that the output signal V out
is equal to the derivative of the input signal amplified by negative RC. And it is a differentiator circuit. Technically, you could also build a differentiator circuit with an inductor. But as you could imagine, because inductors and capacitors are opposite, if you want to do it with an inductor circuit, the inductor would have to be in the feedback path. So this is also a differentiator circuit. In practice, however, you would almost always build these with capacitors, not with inductors. With microelectronics, capacitors can be made much smaller than inductors, so they're almost used exclusively instead of inductors. But in theory, at least, this would also give you a differentiator circuit. Now you can probably guess without even cheating and going on to the next page of what would happen if you swap where the capacitor and where the resistor are. Sure enough, you would get an integrator circuit. So here we have a similar circuit, except now the capacitor is in the feedback path and the resistor is in the feed forward path. Once again, we will connect up a voltage source, V in, and we'll analyze the circuit. We'll begin by defining VC as the voltage across the capacitor. I'm arbitrarily putting the plus on the left, the minus on the right. It's a variable. We could put it however we want. If we analyze this circuit, the first thing we see is that V out is minus VC of T, and that's because V minus equals V plus equals zero volts by virtue of the virtual short circuit approximation. That means that V out is equal to minus VC of T. But recall, the voltage across the capacitor is a voltage across the capacitor at times zero plus one over C times the integral from zero to T of IC of tau D tau. But what is IC? IC is defined as the current through the capacitor in that direction, which is also equal to the current through this resistor. IC equals IR. Why does it equal to IR? Because the current into the op amp is equal to zero. There's no current flowing actually in there. So IC is equal to IR. IR is just V in over R from Ohm's law. So V out of T equals minus VC at times zero plus one over RC times the integral from zero to T, V in of tau, D tau. What we see now is the output is the integral of the input scaled by one over RC, and also there's a negative sign in there as well. One point to make about integrator circuits, it's very easy to saturate an op amp this way. For example, if you had a constant voltage being applied, if you integrate a constant, it's just the area under that curve, it just increases like a ramp, and you can very quickly get up to the saturation voltage of the op amp. The last topic in this set of notes is a very, very interesting circuit called the Baxendahl Tone Control Circuit. This circuit will be an integral part of your final project in EE210. The Baxendahl tone control circuit is based upon the concept that capacitors look like open circuits for very low frequencies and look like short circuits for high frequencies. So if you recall, we saw earlier that for a capacitor, the ratio of voltage to current was one over 
omega c. And we saw that as the frequency of operation went down, the capacitor was more like an open circuit. And as the frequency went up, the capacitor was more like a short circuit. So we're going to use these low and high frequency properties of capacitors to create a circuit that can independently control the low frequency and high frequency gain. This is called a tone control circuit, where it could be used, for example, if you feed music into this circuit, you can, by turning one pot, increase the amount of trouble or decrease the amount of trouble. And independently, by turning another pot, you can increase or decrease the amount of bass in the circuit. This circuit was first developed by Peter Baxadol in 1952, and this URL here gives you the original article. What we're going to be looking at in this course is a variation of the original Baxadol tone control circuit. So what is it made up of? It is made up of an op amp right here. It's made up of two resistors R1 down here that are the same two resistors R2 up here that are the same as each other, not necessarily the same as R1. There's going to be a separate resistor R3 here. Two potentiometers, usually we have the same value, one down here, one up here. We're going to have one capacitor in series with this potentiometer, and the other capacitor is going to be in parallel with this top potentiometer. Before we analyze it, let's talk a little bit about some important features of this. First off, we're going to use two separate pots for separate control of bass and treble. The top pot is going to control the bass. The bottom pot is going to control the treble. Another property is for middle frequencies, and we'll talk about this in a minute. For middle frequencies, the gain is going to be unity one, regardless of where the pots are. Basically, the middle frequencies depends on the actual capacitor values. It's beyond the scope of this part of the course. All that we need to know for now is it's going to be approximately 800 to 1000 hertz, which is sort of mid-range in the audio range for the capacitor values we will use. Next important point is if both pots are in their middle setting, the gain is going to be one unity for all frequencies. So we see that for middle frequencies, the gain is always one regardless of the pot setting. And for all frequencies, low frequencies, middle frequencies, high frequencies alike, the gain is going to be one if the pots are set in the middle. Next thing we're going to see is that the values of these resistors, these R2 and R1 resistors, will allow us to set the amount of gain and attenuation for the low frequencies and high frequencies. R1 is going to control high frequency gain or attenuation. And R2 is going to control low frequency gain or attenuation. Second to last point, for this circuit to work as we want it to, the capacitor C1 has to be much, much less orders of magnitude smaller than capacitor C2. And we'll see why on the next page. Finally, R3, this last resistor value, has to be large in comparison with the other resistors in the circuit. Once again, we will see why in the upcoming pages. So let's first look at this circuit under low frequency operation. Remember that the capacitors for very low frequencies look like open circuits. So for inputs that are low enough, we're going to model both capacitors as open circuits. Are they technically open circuits? No, but the resistances are going to be so high that for all intents and purposes, we're going to consider them to be open circuits. So they're approximately open circuits. Let's analyze this circuit. This non-inverting input is grounded, it's zero volts. By virtue of the virtual short circuit approximation, the inverting input is also zero volts. 
Let's now do KCL at this point here. Well, first off, we see that there's no current flowing through this resistor. Why? There's an open circuit down here, and this part goes into the inverting terminal of the op amp, which has zero current. So the voltage drop across R3 is zero, so this voltage is also zero volts. Now let's do KCL at this node. So we're looking at that current plus that current plus that current is equal to zero. This current is going to be zero minus V in over its resistance. Its resistance is going to be R2 plus a portion of the pot resistance. So we'll call it R2 plus X times RP. X is some number between zero and one. The current going down here is zero amps, as I mentioned before. The current going to the right is zero minus V out over the rest of this pot plus this other R2. So it's going to be R2 plus, this is now one minus X times RP. And the sum of that has to equal zero. You solve this equation for V out, we get V out is equal to minus R2 plus one minus X times RP all over R2 plus X times RP times Vn. Let's look at this for the two extreme positions of the potentiometer. When X equals one, in other words, when the pot is all the way to the right, that's gonna give us our minimum gain. And the gain, if you plug it into this equation here, plug x equals 1, you get minus R2 over R2 plus RP. If this pot is all the way to the left, that's going to give us maximum gain. The gain is going to be what in this case? When x is equal to 0, we get minus R2 plus RP over R2. Notice that these are reciprocals of each other. The gains are reciprocals, and it depends on R2, and it depends on RP. Note, R1 doesn't show up at all in this equation, and notice the position of this pot is meaningless. Why? Because of this open circuit here. Because of this open circuit here, the bottom part of the circuit has no bearing at all. So for low frequency signals, basically this is the part of the circuit that plays an important part. Moving the pot from one end to the other allows us to go from a minimum gain all the way up to a maximum gain. Now let's assume that the input is a middle frequency. In a middle frequency, remember that C2 is much, much larger than C1, which means that one over omega C2 is much, much less than one over omega C1. Remember one over omega C is the quote unquote resistance of the capacitor. So what this means is that C2 looks like a short circuit for lower frequencies than C1 does. So for low frequencies, they both look like open circuits. As the frequency goes up, C2 has less resistance. So we're going to model it as a short circuit. Is it actually a short circuit? No, but for ease of doing the math, we're going to say it's a short circuit. Notice C1 is still an open circuit. When we try to analyze this circuit, once again, zero volts down here, zero volts here. There's no current flowing anywhere along this wire. So we have zero volts here. Now, because this resistor RP, this pot is shorted out, when we do KCL here, 
that current plus that current plus that current is equal to zero, you get zero minus V in over R2 plus zero minus V out over R2 is equal to zero. We get V out is equal to minus V in, which is one of the properties, as we go back a couple pages here, one of the properties of these Baxendall tone control circuits. Regardless of where the pod is, if you have a middle frequency, so that C2 is a short circuit and C1 is still an open circuit, we get that V out is equal to negative V1, unity gain with just a sign change. So it's independent of the value of R1 and independent of R2 and independent of both pot locations. So for middle frequencies, regardless of what you choose for R1 and R2, and regardless of where you put those two pots, its gain is going to be unity, one of the properties of the circuit. Let's look at the third and last situation. As the frequency continues to go up, eventually both C1 and C2 look like short circuits. So originally, they both looked like open circuits. Then C2 looked like a short and C1 still looked like an open circuit. As you increase in frequency, eventually they both look like short circuits. Let's analyze this circuit now. Zero volts down here, zero volts up there. This is zero volts. So now when we try to apply KCL at this point here, we basically see that this current plus that current plus that current has to be zero. Let's do the math. Zero minus V in over R1 plus XRP is this current here. Once again, we're going to divide up this pot resistance that way. So some portion of RP is going to be to the left of the wiper blade, some portion to the right of the wiper blade. And so the total resistance here to the left is R1 plus XRP. The current to the right now is zero minus V out over this resistance, which is R1 plus 1 minus X times RP. The third current is 0 minus V1, which we don't know what V1 is here. Let's, let's call V1 the voltage at that point. 0 minus V1 over R3. But here's where another stipulation we made earlier is important. We said that R3 is very large, much larger than any of the other resistors. That means that this current is very small. We could ignore it. Is this current through here actually zero? No, but it's going to be so small that we're going to ignore it. Solving this equation for V out, we get V out is equal to minus R1 plus 1 minus X times RP all over R1 plus X times RP times V in. As with the circuit on two pages ago, we're now going to look at two extreme cases. We're going to look when X equals 1, when this pot down here is all the way to the right, that's going to give us our minimum gain. And the minimum gain is what? When x is equal to 1, the gain is equal to minus R1 over R1 plus RP. Likewise, when the pot is all the way to the left, it's going to give us the maximum gain. And what is the value of the gain? 
is going to be minus R1 plus RP over R1. Notice that these are reciprocals. Couple important points. R1, RP, and the location of the pot dictate the gain for high frequencies. R2 and this pot have no effect. So once again, for high frequencies, this part of the circuit is important. For low frequencies, it was this part of the circuit was important. For middle frequencies, neither one of those parts was important. And so we end up getting a circuit now. If you go back to the original circuit here, we see that by changing this pot location, we can control the gain for the low frequency portion of the signal. By changing this pot down here, we can change the gain of the high frequency portion of the signal. And so imagine VN being music, it's going to have low frequency components, high frequency components, middle frequency components, and we can separately adjust the gain of each one by changing and moving these two pots. You will investigate this a little bit in laboratory next week, and then again in the final project. This wraps up the packet of notes dealing with capacitors and inductors. We will definitely look at the Baxendall tone control circuit more once we have more mathematical tools under our belt, but hopefully at this point at least, you see basically how the frequency dependent properties of the capacitors can be used to our advantage to give us a circuit that does something different for low frequency inputs and high frequency inputs. Have a good day.